When was the last time the risen Christ revealed himself in visible form to one of his own? In the last 20 centuries, there have been many who have claimed to have seen the resurrected Christ, but the last certain lifting of the veil and uh, parting of the curtain to see him was what is recorded in the concluding book of your New Testament, which is the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse, which means unveiling. That book was written at the close of the first Christian century, somewhere between 90 and 100 A.D., and on the lips of believers in Jesus Christ, there was a single question. That question was, where is the Lord Jesus? The church at Ephesus had lost their pastor. John, the revelator, John, the beloved disciple, had been exiled to the island of Patmos for his faith in Christ. Patmos was that, that uh, rugged piece of rock that juts like a fist out of the waters of the Aegean Sea. They asked, where is Christ? The ruler of Rome, the emperor, was Domitian. He was a megalomaniac who refused to receive any correspondence or any mail that was not addressed to him as Dominus et Deus, or Lord and God, Domitian. He was persecuting believers in the empire, and the believers asked, where is the Lord Christ? All but one of the original 12 disciples had gone on to be with the Lord. John was the one who remained, long gone was Simon Peter, the big fisherman, long gone was Simon the zealot, Matthew the tax collector, James the brother of John. Of all those in the Roman Empire at the close of that first Christian century, only about 10% had placed faith in Christ, 90% were still active in their persecution of the church. Perhaps more interesting than that is that there was no written New Testament, no bound New Testament. You couldn't go to the shelf at your house to, to pull off the, the Word of God and read it to, to receive strength and to receive encouragement. And the people were asking the question, where is the Lord Christ? It was the atmosphere such as that. In that kind of a context that the pastor of the church at Ephesus, John the beloved disciple, was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. If you'll open your scriptures to that last book of the New Testament, the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, and it is one revelation. We often say revelations and put an S on the end. There is no S. God gave one single revelation to John. Basically, he was saying, John, when the world around you is collapsing and um, you're being attacked as a believer from all different sides, there's only one direction to look, and that is up. And what you see is the Lord Jesus Christ. And John gives us this vision of the Lord. It's the last time that such a vision was given to one of the Lord's disciples with certainty, with authenticity, with integrity of reporting it. The vision that John had of the Lord Jesus Christ while he was on that island of Patmos. Let me encourage you to please stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Revelation chapter 1, we'll begin reading at verse 9, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, he was a religious exile there, almost a hundred years old. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. Then he lists the names of those churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna, to Pergamum, Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to his feet, girded across his breast with a golden girdle. And his head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been caused to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters or rushing waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in its strength and when I saw him 
I fell at his feet as a dead man. And he laid his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. And then these next two verses give explanation to what we've read. Write, therefore, the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which shall take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or the messengers, perhaps the pastors, of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. May God add his richest blessings to this, the reading of his holy word. And may his spirit apply the preaching and teaching of his word to your heart and to my heart this day. Please be seated. Where is the Lord Jesus? At the end of that first century, believers were asking that as they were facing persecution from without and, and some heresy and divisiveness from within. Where is Christ? Well, the Lord gave John a word to give to them and to give to us. For when John the apostle, who was in the spirit of the Lord's day, turned to see a vision of the cosmic Christ, not the cradled Christ of Bethlehem, not the crucified Christ of Calvary, but the cosmic Christ reigning supreme as Lord over all the universe, do you know what he saw? He said, I saw him walking in the midst of his churches. He wasn't in Rome the center of political and military power. He wasn't in Athens, the center of intellectual and philosophical power. He wasn't at Ephesus, the center of banking and finance. No, John said, when I turned to see him, I saw him in the midst of his churches. You ever ask that question today? Where is the Lord Jesus? The answer abides in the same place it did at the end of that first century. The Christ who is seated at the right hand of God the Father is also present in the midst of his churches. And there's two things we apply from that. First of all, he is present with his church and in his church wherever that church is. Now, some of you may know that these seven churches that are listed here, and some of them have names that are a little difficult to pronounce, were all found in towns in what was then Roman Asia Minor. We call it today Turkey. And if you trace them on a map, they almost form a perfect circle. John looked and saw each of those churches as if it were a golden lampstand, brightly shining, boldly manifesting the light of the gospel. And in the midst of them, there walked one, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Where is the Lord Jesus? He's in the midst of his churches. Ephesus was a metropolitan city, about a Population of 750,000 people in the suburbs and in the city proper. And Jesus was found there walking in the midst of that metropolitan church. Thyatira was a rural rustic town in the highlands of Asia Minor. But when he looked, he saw Jesus walking in the midst of that church in Thyatira. Where is Jesus today? He is wherever Christians cower in caves in Cuba or in China. He is where Christians congregate in crystal cathedrals in California. Wherever his church is, we are given the vision that Christ is there walking in their midst. But the Lord is also walking in the midst of his churches, whatever the church is. There is presented here in this text the picture of the ideal church. You know how we pray that our church, all churches, could be the ideal church. There were golden lampstands, seven of them, a perfect number of them, perfect in their completion, perfect in the number that the Lord desired. Golden, that means they were pure in their character and in their doctrine and in their teaching and in their practice. Lampstands, shining purposeful, conspicuous like a city set on the hill, giving off the light of life in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the ideal. That's what the church is supposed to be. But thank goodness the Lord does not lose the church in the ideal because the church that was real was something different than the ideal. In chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, the story of these seven churches is the story of powerless, penniless, leaderless, divided, and some of them even heretical fellowships. But the Word of God says even at that, the risen Lord was walking in the midst of his churches. 
Christians at the end of that first century witnessed the revelation of this truth. The Lord is in his churches wherever they are, whatever they are, and he sees them as they are, and he sees them as they can be. But you might say, well, what was a sovereign Lord doing there? Well, the text indicates that he was walking there, just tending to the life and the needs and the mission of his people. You may ask, well, what does the Lord know about his church and about all churches? What does God know about Pioneer Drive Baptist Church? Simply this, he knows everything. He knows it all. Every concern of this church is a concern of an omniscient Lord. All the business of this church is a concern of a sovereign Lord. All the leadership of this church rests upon the heart of an all-caring Lord. All the needs of this church, he walks in the midst of them. The whole future of this church he sees as if it were a golden lampstand. Sometimes in my own humanity and limitedness, I, I, I get frustrated because I don't know all that's going on at this church. And I'm the pastor. I don't know all that has gone on. I don't know all that's going on. I don't know all that will go on. And sometimes in between preaching and teaching and speaking and counseling and visiting and organizing, I can't keep up with it all. Maybe somebody else could. I can't. And that's when this solemn, sacred truth comes to me. The Lord Jesus Christ walks in the midst of his church. It is he who knows every Sunday school teacher and every class. It is he who is aware of every need. It is he who is able to bind every wound in this church and make whole everything that is broken. It is he who is able to move in and out amongst us by the sovereignty of his Holy Spirit. That's why John said, when I last saw Jesus, he was walking in the midst of his churches. I think the only hope and confidence or encouragement that I can have for our church or any church is not that any one of us are overlords or masters of the situation, but that the same Lord that walked in the midst of his church in ancient Asia walks in the midst of his churches, specifically this church today. You say, well, what kind of Lord is he? Well, there was given to John a series of symbols trying to say what mere words cannot say, or emblems trying to communicate what, what language and sentences uh, are unable to speak, a vision of the reigning cosmic Christ. And who did he see when he looked to see? Well, the first thing John says is, I saw one interceding like a great high priest. Verses 12 and 13, he says, When I turned, I saw those seven golden lampstands, the churches, and in the midst of them, someone like a son of man, that was the title chosen from Daniel that Jesus loved to use for himself in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I saw one in the midst of those churches like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded across his breast with a golden girdle. That's the dress of a biblical priest. And John says, when I saw him immediately, the first thing I saw was Christ as my interceding priest. The dress of a Jewish priest was well known. It was a long flowing robe. In fact, the very word that is used here is the word that was used of the garb of a priest. But not only that, he's not only wearing the garb of a priest, but that golden sash was the sash of a king. He's a priest who is also a king. And it is our promise forever that at the right hand of God, there is one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our bridge builder to God. That's what the word priest means. Pontifex. In Latin, the word for priest means bridge builder. Jesus is our priest at the right hand of God, representing us to God and representing God to us. And we need no other priest. In the background of the coming of the Lord Jesus, there were not just decades. There were centuries of inadequate priests, inadequate priests making sacrifice of animals to God. But when Jesus, or rather when John looked up to see Christ as he is, he said, there he stood, our priest. Not only the one who makes sacrifice, he is the sacrifice. John saw him and his palms were scarred for us. His side was riven for us. His feet punctured for us. His brow wounded for us. Our priest. There is no priest in the pulpit at Pioneer Drive Baptist Church except a believer priest. And we are all believer priests. And there is 
in heaven above, no priest or intercessor for us other than the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not approach God through the saints. We don't approach God through Mary. The scripture says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, there is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. He bears the mark of a priest. And the first thing that John saw when he saw Jesus, he is the one who ever lives to make intercession for us. He is our priest. He looked again and he said the second thing that he was given to see in this vision of the risen Christ, he saw him not only as the interceding Christ, but as the pre-existing Christ. Look at verse 14. He said, I looked and his head, his hair were like white wool like like snow you know our lord when he was crucified was a relatively young man in his early 30s literally the lord only knows heaven only knows the features of his face or the color of his hair or the gait of his walk the the gestures of his hands or the, the the tone of his voice but when john saw him he saw him with hair like white wool white as snow now again this is the book of symbols this is a book of emblems trying to say what cannot be said with mere words, but, but, but they're being said with, with pictures. And it's John's way of saying, this is the one who has been forever. This is the ancient of days. This is the one I wrote about in my gospel who said of himself before Abraham was, I am. Before there was ever a Bethlehem, Jesus could say, I am. Before the psalmist ever wrote about the Lord being his shepherd, Jesus could say, I am. Before Isaiah ever described a suffering servant, before one drop of rain ever fell upon Noah, before daybreak ever burst forth on Adam in Eden, Jesus could say, I am. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. This is John's way of saying he is indeed the pre-existing Christ. He looked a third time, and when he saw, he saw that the risen Christ was the observing Christ. He looked at the eyes of Jesus and said he's not just the interceding Christ, and he's not just the pre-existing Christ. He is the observing Christ. His eyes were like a blazing flame of fire. You know, even in the days of his flesh, at his trial, when Peter denied the Lord, Jesus cast a glance at Peter, and just a glance, Peter was broken by it. When John saw the ruling risen reigning Christ the enthroned Christ he said I looked at him and when I looked into his eyes they were like a burning flame of fire today we would say they were laser like in their intensity John's trying to say what language cannot say that everywhere he looks Jesus peers through the veneer and the facade of life and sees things as they really are there is an all-seeing Christ who looks at his world today and sees it all. We don't know what to believe. We don't know what to think. We don't know who to trust anymore. Jesus sees it all as it really is. He sees our church as it really is. He sees you as you really are. Psalmist said, before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, thou dost know it all. He understands our thoughts from afar. He scrutinizes our paths and our lying down and is intimately acquainted with all our ways. John said he's the observing Christ. And then he said he's also the judging Christ. He looked at his feet and he says they were like bronze glowing in a furnace. He's scanning this vision of Jesus the cosmic reigning regal Christ. And he starts at his head and works his way down to his feet. And he says, when I looked at his feet, they were not only like bronze, but like bronze that had been heated, like, like molten metal in a furnace. In the Old Testament, bronze was the metal of judgment. Everything in the temple, everything in the uh, tabernacle that was used for judgment was made of bronze. It's a biblical symbol or emblem of judgment. John said, when I saw him, he was not only the observing Christ, he's also the judging Christ. 
Now, modern man has almost written off the possibility of a transcendent judgment in this life or in the life to come. Hugh Hefner of Playboy fame ridiculed the fact that there is a God who is, quote, a gaseous whale who is chalking it up every time somebody sleeps with somebody else. Our generation is willing to think of a cradled Christ or a crucified Christ or even a coming Christ. But the vision that John saw was also one of a judging Christ. The Lord Jesus stands over time and over eternity, over humanity and our individual human lives. And he will bring about what is written in Hebrews 9, 27. It is appointed unto men once to die. And after that, judgment. John said he is the judging Christ. And at the end of verse 15, he looked up again and he said, I heard a speaking Christ. For when his voice broke out on John, he said, his voice was like the sound of many waters or like the sound of thundering, rushing water. John was living. He was exiled on that island of Patmos, probably lived by himself in a cave. As I said, nearly a hundred years old. And day and night, night and day, unabated, the waves broke against the rocks of that island. The waves pounded the surf. I remember as a boy growing up in Southern California, we'd go and spend a whole day at the beach, often, two or three times a week during the summer, baseball was over. And you'd go home and you'd lay on your bed, lie on your bed, and you just, you felt the wave still, that that rhythm, that pounding of the ocean, it was so loud. It's like there are parts, places you stand at Niagara Falls, and you can't hear the person next to you. They can talk to you, they can scream at you, and you cannot hear because the the water is so thunderously strong, it roars, and you, you feel literally the roar within you. That's what John is describing here. When I heard the speaking of the Lord Christ, he said, it reminded me more than anything else of the power and the authority of many rushing waters. It's John's way of saying that when he speaks, he speaks with unparalleled authority. You know, the interesting thing about the Lord Jesus Christ, he and he alone of all who ever walked on this planet stand peerless and sublime and unique and supreme among any you might name beside him. In every other field of endeavor, you can say a great name and you can match it with another great name. You say the name of of Shakespeare in literature in England and you can match it with a Voltaire in France or a Goethe in Germany. If you name a Newton in in physics, you can name an Einstein in the 20th century. If you name a Bach in music, you can name a Mozart or a Beethoven. If in art you name a Michelangelo, you can name a Raphael. If you name a political leader like Napoleon, you can name any one of the Caesars. You can par the list up as high or as long as you wish, and you can match every name with another name about whom it could be debated he or she is their equal. But when it comes to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, there stands no equal. You say the name Jesus alongside Muhammad, and Muhammad doesn't belong there. You say the name Jesus and the name Confucius and Confucius doesn't belong there. Say the name Jesus and the name Buddha and Buddha doesn't belong there. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. No other name but the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone has the name that is above every name. His voice speaks with an abiding authority. The only reason, the only reason the average Joe on the street has ever even heard the name of Nero or Tiberius or especially Domitian or Pontius Pilate is because at one point the lives of those men intersected the life of that humble carpenter from Nazareth who just happens to be the son of the living God. His voice speaks with an everlasting authority like a magnificent roaring waterfall. What if on a Sunday morning, what if on the Lord's day, you suddenly heard a voice like a trumpet and you turned to see and what you saw was what John has written here. I remember the day 
that I was six years ago this month, I think, I was walking down the corridor at my mom's memory care unit in, Wake, in Waco, and Bill and his wife Mallory of three years were walking with me. We were going out to our cars, and Bill just sort of nonchalantly said, well, Dad, how would you feel about being a granddad? And my knees literally buckled. That had never happened to me before. Just the power of those words. He had to steady me to keep me from falling to the ground. But John, when he saw this vision, fell on his face before the Lord as though he were dead. Now remember, John had seen a lot. John was there on that mountain of transfiguration when all the deity, all the the glory, all the majesty of God that had been resident in Christ prior to the incarnation but had been hidden during his days on this earth could not remain hidden any longer and it just came bursting forth on top of that mountain and there Peter and James and John cowered before the Lord. John was a witness to that transfiguration. John was a witness to the crucifixion. He alone of the disciples stood with Mary, the mother of our Lord. And watched the blood of Christ fall into the ground. That blood that cleanses us from all our unrighteousness. John was a witness to the resurrection. He was there on Easter Sunday morning. One of the first ones he walked in and he saw those grave clothes neatly folded. As if somebody tidied up the place before he left. John was a witness to the ascension. I mean John had seen it all. And yet he said when I saw him the cosmic Christ, reigning, regal, royal Christ. I fell at his feet as though I were dead. And here's the really great thing. That same cosmic Christ is the very same Jesus we read about in the Gospels. For the first thing he said to his servant who had not seen him or heard his audible voice in the past 60 years were these words, John Don't be afraid. When the angel appeared to his mother Mary, the first words were, do not be afraid, Mary. When the angels appeared to the shepherds in the fields of Bethlehem, the first words were, fear thou not. Don't be afraid. On that Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus looked at those three bewildered disciples, trembling, shaking disciples, he said to them, don't be afraid. And on resurrection night, when Jesus appeared in the upper room, locked doors, 11 disciples, 10 disciples, fearful of their lives, Jesus said, stop being afraid. And now, 60 years later, when the aging, trembling servant John sees Jesus, he is the same Jesus. The first thing he said to him is, John, stop being afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but behold, which is the little Greek word idu, it means surprise. I'm alive forevermore. And John, I hold the keys of death and of Hades. So stop being afraid. You know, that might be the word that you need to hear this morning. Maybe you're involved in the leadership of this church and you feel the weight of that leadership sometimes and you know that you're responsible for some of the ministry that takes place in this congregation, the ministry that takes place in this community. And instead of being overwhelmed by it all and fearful, we need to hear him say, stop being afraid. It is I. She's not in this worship service. She was in the last worship service. Unexpectedly, she said goodbye to her husband seven weeks ago. And we've been praying for Deanne and walking through this time with Deanne Curry. And this week, she discovered that she has kidney cancer. And Eddie's not here to walk with her. But she's heard him say, She's heard Jesus say, don't be afraid. It is I. 
And I'm glad to say the prognosis is good, but we don't know what tomorrow will bring. You don't know what tomorrow will bring for you. And I don't. But we hear him say this morning, you don't have to be afraid. Fear thou not, for I'm with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Let's pray together. with eyes closed and hearts focused on this vision. Can you see Jesus in your mind here? In your mind's eye, do you see the image of the cosmic Christ standing before us, walking in the midst of this, his church? He is our high priest. Hair white like snow, Eyes like flames of fire, feet of judgment made of burnished bronze. Voice with the authority of many waters. His face shining with the same radiance and brilliance and strength of the sun. And he speaks to us. I am the living one. I was dead and surprised I'm alive forevermore. Stop being afraid. Would you like to have a constant companion just like that? One who is victor over death and the grave, risen forevermore, your bridge builder to God. It may be that there has never been a time when you fell down on your knees consciously, earnestly saying, Lord, be my Lord today. You're a father, a mother, a grandparent, an adult, young person or college student. This morning, the cosmic, reigning, royal Jesus Christ still bears those wounds visible above for you. And you would say to him today, Lord of all, be my Lord. Be my Savior, my King. He'll do just that. And as he moves into your life, he will speak those words, stop being afraid. If never prayed that, if you've never meant that, it's time. The Spirit of God is calling you now to give your heart, your life in faith to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Would you pray that? Just say, Lord of all, be my Lord. Be master and ruler, overseer, presider over all of my life. I want to live for you. Lord, be my Lord. Father, I pray you'll move in the hearts of men and women, boys and girls right now, who need to confess you. Just as Miley did this morning, to take that public stand of faith in Christ. Give them courage this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to sing a hymn of commitment this morning. Appropriately, I surrender all. There are a lot of reasons people come to church and uh, I hope you came this morning to get a fresh glimpse of Jesus. He is here. He is among us. He knows all that's going on at this church and in your life. And his word is true and it's sincere. Stop being afraid. Trust me. Walk with me. If you need to give your life in faith to Christ, you do what Miley did last Sunday morning at this very time, this very hour. You just slip down this pew and say, Pastor, I'm trusting Jesus, and I'm taking my public stand for you, for him. He desires that we make it public. He says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. But there's no silent saints, secret saints. 
we're to take a stand for Christ. This isn't the only stand we take. This is just the beginning. But if you'd come in simple faith today, trusting Christ, we'll be here to receive you. More importantly, the Lord is waiting. Or if you're looking for a church family and God has spoken to you and said, this is where you need to be, and we'd love to have you part of this church family to grow and serve here in Abilene with us. If you need to come to the altar just to pray, it's always open. However Christ is leading, you come as we sing together, I surrender all.